student winners of an essay contest get a chance to meet a Newbery Award-winning author Tuesday night. Christopher Paul Curtis, author of The Watsons Go to Birmingham 1963, meets with four winners of an essay contest based on his book about civil rights in the South. The kids got to go on a tour of the Robert H. Jackson Center and learn more about the legacy of Jackson. Curtis will be speaking to 1,200 students Wednesday morning at the Regland A. Civic Center and again at the Robert H. Jackson Center in the afternoon. An award-winning author is in Jamestown Wednesday to speak to more than 1,000 local students about the American Civil Rights Movement. Christopher Curtis, author of the Newbery Award-winning The Watsons Go to Birmingham 1963, at the Robert H. Jackson Center in the afternoon discussing prejudice and discrimination during the 1960s. Curtis says he tries to use his novel to educate young students. We hear a lot about terrorism now. Uh, we see nothing in the United States like the terrorism that happened throughout the South in the 50s and the 60s directed at black people. And hopefully uh, young people will read the book and might ask more questions pick up a history book and try to find out what's going on, pick up other books and read about it. Jackson Center officials say his work fits with the legacy of Robert H. Jackson, who ruled in a Brown v. Board of Education case. The trials and troubles experienced by Kenny Watson and his family pulled all of us into the feeling that we all knew people like the Watsons and could easily think of them as being neighbors of us. We are also very pleased that Mr. Curtis is able to join us as part of the Robert H. Jackson's mission. The center's mission is to further the world's understanding of civil rights. Today we have the privilege of seeing original film clips showing the civil unrest that existed in the United States that led up to the Birmingham church bombing in 1963. As you watch this video, notice the large number of young people that band together to express their feelings by way of a peaceful march for equality. Many of these children were your age. Also notice the extreme means used to keep them from successfully bringing attention to their situation. Listen carefully to the words of Martin Luther King Jr. as he delivers one of the most powerful speeches ever presented. Now we take you back to 1963. Please hold your applause for Christopher Paul Curtis. By far, the bloodiest battleground of the civil rights era was Birmingham. In the early 1960s, the town was a racial powder keg waiting to explode. Birmingham was then the most segregated city in America, and it had the longest history of aggressive racial violence. Birmingham was called Bombingham by people in the Civil Rights Movement because of this long chain of unsolved bombings of black homes. Much of the violence was perpetrated by the Ku Klux Klan. As evidenced in the beating of the Freedom Riders, the city's law enforcement was known for its working relationship with the Klan. The Klan had uh, more influence perhaps in Birmingham than they did uh, in a lot of the other southern cities. And I think that uh, contributed to the Klan's sense of bravado where they felt like they could get away with anything, that nobody would hold them accountable. In this charged atmosphere, one of the cruelest of all acts of Klan terror occurred. The 16th Street Baptist Church was a symbol of the civil rights movement in Birmingham. The sacred chamber served as a staging point for demonstrations against segregated downtown public facilities. From the steps of the church, hundreds of black marchers, most of them kids, encountered the extreme force of police commissioner Bull Connor's attack dogs and high-pressure fire hoses. For radical segregationists like the Klan, the 16th Street Baptist Church became a special target. On a hazy Sunday morning in September of 1963, Four young black girls attended Sunday school at the 16th Street Church. The day's Bible lesson was, A Love That Forgives. The four girls moved to the basement to don choir robes when suddenly a noise shot through the church like a cannon. 
A bomb planted near the basement ripped through the house of worship. Under an avalanche of shattered glass, toppled brick, and tangled metal, a gruesome discovery. Cynthia Wesley, age 14. Carol Robertson, age 14. Addie Mae Collins, age 14. And Denise McNair, age 11. All were found dead. Their bodies buried atop one another. Of all the bad things that happened, uh in the South during the uh, Civil Rights era, to me, that was uh, the worst. Because you had four innocent little girls that hadn't done anything to anybody going to worship on Sunday morning uh, in church, and, uh, and they're killed for absolutely no reason except that they are, were black. My name is Christopher Curtis, and I'm an author, and a lot of times when I tell young people that, they'll look at me and they say, oh, you write books? You must be a genius. Do I look like a genius to you? The correct answer is yes. But no, I'm not a genius, and you don't have to be a genius to write a book. Writing books is like anything else that you do. How many of you speak more than one language? Some of you, not many. How many of you play a musical instrument? Okay, we get more there. How many of you play a sport? What do you have to do with all three of those things to get better? Practice. practice. You have to practice. And I became an author through practice. And it's not like I woke up one morning and said, I'm going to be an author. i got to start practicing. I practiced accidentally. And the way that happened, who could tell me what this is? It's a hand, but it's something else. It's a writing hand, but it's something else. How many of you have looked at a map of the United States before? This is Michigan. This is Mi uh, Michigan looks like a hand or a mitten. And we can hold up our hand and give an accurate map of our state and show where we're from. And I'm from a city right there called Flint, Michigan. And when I graduated from high school, Flint was a very different kind of place. Because if you didn't have money to go to college, or you didn't have good grades to get into a college, or you just didn't want to go to college, one of the things that you could do is you could go work in a car factory, and you would make what is the equivalent today of $35 or $40 an hour. So right after high school, I said to my mother and father, that's it. I don't want to go to college. I want to start making some money. And that caused my parents to get into an argument. My mother said, no, I don't want you to go in that factory and start working. You'll go in there, you'll buy stuff, you'll get trapped, you'll never come out. My father, dads are different. My father said, let him go. <laughs> It'll make a man out of him. He thought if I went in the factory, I'd see how rough it was and I'd want to go to college. Who ended up being right, mom or dad? Mom or dad? If you don't listen to anything else that I say here today, listen to this. It'll make your life a lot easier. Mom is right 99.9% .9 of the time. Mom was right. I got in that factory and I lost my mind. I started buying things. Very first thing I bought with my very first paycheck. Now this is a young group. A lot of you aren't going to know what I'm talking about. How many of you remember something called an eight track tape player? <laughs> some of you do, some of you don't. Those of you who don't, eight tracks were tapes that were about the size of this book and they were terrible. You'd stick it into the machine, it would play half a song, it would stop dead in the middle of the song and it'd make a noise and go, rada, 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 rada. <laughs> then it would play the rest of the song and you weren't supposed to notice that, terrible. So with my first check, I went out and I bought a cassette player that had speakers that were this tall. And it costs a lot of money, but I'm making a lot of money. Next thing I did, I went out and I bought a brand new, not just any kind of a car, I bought a brand, no, not a Cadillac, I was looking for a good car. I bought a brand new 1973 Camaro. Yeah, and I don't like to brag, but I looked really good driving that Camaro. 
Stand up, young man. Turn around. You see the color of the yellow on his jacket? Okay. <laughs> the yellow one, stand up. On the yellow on his jacket there, that's the color my Camaro was. It was bright yellow. You can sit, thank you. It had a black vinyl top. I had a great big afro. You had... It's not funny. You add those three things together, you got good looking. And I knew it. So now I've got a Camaro. I've got a sound system. I'm still living at home with mom and dad. They didn't know how it worked. They thought they could tell me what to do. You can't tell me what to do. I'm 18, I got a job. I'd wake up in the morning, my mother'd say, get back in there and make your bed. My father'd say, take the garbage out before you go to work. I said, forget this. And I went and got my own apartment. And that was expensive, because all the things I thought were growing in the cupboards, they weren't growing in there. Someone was buying them and putting them in there. So now I've got a Camaro, I've got a sound system, I've got my own apartment, and for the first time in my life, girls would go out with me. <laughs> I was in Cleveland, Ohio. There was a young man sitting right where you're sitting when I told him that he raised his hand and said, they're just using you, man. <laughs> but I didn't care, I didn't care. That was fine with me. But what I was doing was digging a hole deeper and deeper and staying in the factory longer and longer. And I was supposed to be in that factory for three or four months to make enough money to go to college. How long do you think I ended up working in that factory? No. Nope. No. Nope. I worked in that factory for 13 years. And I hated every single minute of working in that factory. But I think working in the factory is one of the things that turned me into a writer. My job was to put doors on the cars. And the way that would work, there'd be an assembly line right here. And the assembly line is nothing but a chain in the floor. And they put a hook on the chain. Then there's a little cart that goes on the hook. And it gets pulled throughout the factory. And we build the car on it. When the car got to me, it didn't look like a car. It's just the shell of a car. No paint, no engine, no interior, no wheels, no frame, nothing. My job was to put doors on it. And the way it worked, every minute, another car would come by, a steady stream of cars all day long, 10 hours. When a job got to me, I'd take a great big fixture that hung from the ceiling, clamp it down on the car, run back over here, pick up a door. The doors weighed anywhere from 50 to 80 pounds, so they're really heavy. Take the door, slide it into the fixture. Then I would start walking backwards because the line is moving. This hand, I'd have six bolts. This hand, I'd have a motor. I'd put three bolts in the top hinge, three bolts in the bottom hinge, tighten that, tighten that, tighten that, tighten that, take the fixture off, slide it back. My partner would do the next job. There were two of us, we'd do every other job. I wasn't done with this one. I'd take another fixture, clamp it on the car. It told me if the door was fit properly. Never was. Run back over here, pick up a hammer and chisel, put it on the hinge, bam, 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 bam. Fit the door, set that down, take that fixture off, take something called a shim gauge, put it in the door, close the door. It told me how many shims to put in the striker, the thing that the door closes on. Put the shims in, tighten that down, take a motor, tighten that down. Come back out, take another motor, tighten all the bolts again. Run back and do it again. And I would do this 300 times a day. And I was making good money, but I was working like a dog. So my friend and I decided to make it easier Instead of doing every other job like that, he said to me, why don't you do 30 in a row? And then I'll do 30 in a row. This way, we each got a half hour out of every hour to sit down and do whatever we wanted to do. What do you suppose I did during my half hours off the line? Don't say eat donuts and sleep. What do you think I did? First, I started reading. I would read, and I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I'd pick up a book. And I'd start to read. I really started loving reading when I was working there because it made time go by. And I'd turn the pages on some books. And then I'd turn it again. And it felt like the pages were getting heavier and heavier. I didn't want to read this book. It was terrible. And I'd say to myself, you know what? I think I can write something better than that. So I started writing. And I was practicing. And I didn't even realize it, but I was practicing. And I wasn't writing fiction at the time. Mostly I was writing things like, I hate my foreman's guts, I wish he died. <laughs> but I was writing, I was practicing. So that, I think, is one of the things that turned me into a writer. Next thing that turned me into a writer, we have to go back to the map. This is? Michigan. 
my wife is from a country that nobody in here has ever heard of before. It's a very small country you've probably never heard of. It's called Trinidad. Who's heard of Trinidad? Let's see how many hands stay up when I ask this. Who knows where Trinidad is? Right there. Where's Trinidad? Caribbean. Come here. <laughs> you guys didn't know where Trinidad is? Oh yeah, now you know, yeah. I mean, he spilled the beans. Uh, any day, you know, uh, What is your name? Christopher. Nice to meet you, Christopher. Christopher, turn around. Walk with me, Christopher. Come on, Christopher. Christopher, how, other than having such a classy name, how did you know where Trinidad is? My grandparents. Excuse us for a minute. Christopher, we're trying to promote reading and the importance of reading, so we people will want to read more and can understand more about what's going on in the world. So if I ask you a question, you say it's because I read a lot, okay? <laughs> you got it? You want to practice one time? You think you got it? All right, let's go. Christopher. It's a conversation, Christopher. I say something, you answer. Christopher. Yes. How did you know where Trinidad is? Because I read a lot. Very good, Christopher. Good job, Christopher. And Christopher, some of the time when you read, do you get confused? Yes. I bet you do. Um, <laughs> and you lose your place in the book? Yes, Christopher, when I go to a school or to a, a city, and there's a young man who's got a classy name like Christopher, and he's bright enough and brave enough to raise his hand, and he knows that Trinidad is the southernmost of the Caribbean islands, and he loses his place in books, I always bring a bookmark for that young man so he won't lose his place again. So. There you go, Christopher. That's your bookmark. Have a seat, Christopher. As Christopher told us, enough, I knew it. I could just feel the quality. <laughs> can you have a bookmark? Yes, you can, but you have to get this thing called a J-O-B. <laughs> As Christopher told us, Trinidad is the southernmost of the Caribbean islands. It's right next to Venezuela. And the way my, the way my wife and I met, this is... Yeah. Trinidad would be in the basement somewhere. It's so far south. She moved from Trinidad to a city up here in Canada called Hamilton. And Hamilton and Flint have something every year called the Canusa Games. And it's a sports competition. One year it's in Flint, the next year it's in Hamilton. I was on the basketball team from Flint one year. I was dribbling down the court. I looked in the stands. I saw a young woman. I said, oh, she is bad. <laughs> and remember, I had that yellow Camaro, and I looked really good driving that Camaro, so I had a lot of confidence. And I went up to her and I started talking and we talked for a while and I asked her for her phone number. She gave me a number. I went back home, I called it. Turns out it was the number for Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> it's not funny. But I found out her phone number and I started calling her. And now what age groups is this in here? I don't like to do this, but I'm going to have to ask some of you to do me a favor. Uh, because I don't like to embarrass anybody. And there's a group of people in here that gets embarrassed very easily. And I don't want to embarrass them. I'm talking about the boys. So I want all the young women not to listen to what I'm going to say next. You don't have to plug your ears. Just don't listen. I need to talk to the fellas alone for a second. Fellas, are you listening? Yeah. Are you listening? Yeah. Young women, are you not listening? No. Very good. No. Fellas, the reason I want to talk to you alone is 
you're at that age where <laughs> pretty soon changes are going to be taking place. Changes are going to be taking place. Things are going to change. You're not going to understand what's going on. I'm going to help you. What's going to happen is you're going to wake up one morning. You're going to think everything's the same. Something changed. You're going to walk into your English class. You're going to look across the room. You're going to see a little girl. Her name might be Courtney or... <laughs> or Amy or Sarah or... I don't know what her name might be, but you're going to look at her, fellas, and you're going to say, oh, she's gorgeous. <laughs> and you're going to fall in love. Now, how many of you in here have ever been in love before? You know, you know what I think is sad? You're the only adult who raised their hand. No one here, no love in this role. What's going on there? Those of you who have been in love, you know that you don't just fall in love. Strange things start happening. You start doing crazy things. What I did that was crazy when I fell in love, every Friday after working in that factory in Flint, Michigan, I'd jump in that pretty yellow Camaro, and I'd drive across Michigan, and I'd drive across Canada to CK, and I'd come back, and I started going back and forth, and back and forth, and back. And I did it so many times, one day outside of a city here in the thumb of Michigan called Port Huron, my Camaro died. <laughs> it was sad. How do I go CK now? Walk. It was a four hour drive. I wasn't that much in love. How do I go CK? Buses don't go that way. Hitchhike. Would you pick me up hitchhiking? I'd still be on the side of the road. I'll tell you what I did. I did the same thing every last one of you does whenever you have a problem. I went to my mother and I whined. <laughs> and I said, Mama, please let me borrow your car. I want to go see Kay. Please let me borrow. My mother said, stop whining. Take the car. Go see Kay. Every Friday after working in that factory in Flint, Michigan, I'd jump in my mother's car. And I drove across Michigan, and I drove across Canada to CK, and I'd come back, and I started going back and forth, and back and forth, and back. And, and I did it so many times. One day outside of a city here in the thumb of, or here in Canada called London, tell them what happened. I don't know. <laughs> tell them what happened. The car died? My mother's car died. So what do I do now? I couldn't go to my dad because the word was out, don't let Christopher Curtis touch your car, he'll kill it. So what I did was I started calling Kay on the phone. And we would talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And my wife is a great talker. I can tell this because she's not here. She is a great talker. Her name, even her mother knew she was going to be a great talker when she was born because she named her Kay. And what does Kay spell backwards? I rest my case. We would talk and talk and talk. And this was back in the days when the phone company was a monopoly. Now who can raise the tell me what a monopoly is? And I don't mean a board game. What is a monopoly? Wrong. What is a monopoly? It's some sort of company. I need a little more information. Yes. Come here. <laughs> you should raise your hand or I'll mess the general idea we're trying to get across. What is your name? What is it? Marissa. Marissa, nice to meet you. Walk with me, Marissa. <laughs> Marissa. Yeah? How did you know what a monopoly is, Marissa? A monopoly is when one company controls every aspect of the industry. Like there's only one phone company or one gas company. And monopolies are bad because they can charge whatever they want. They're nasty. How did you know what a monopoly is, Marissa? Maris Marissa? Yeah. How did you know? Uh, I read it in the social studies. Excuse us for a minute, please. <laughs> Marissa, it's 
nice that you read in the social studies book, but we're trying to come over and read it. She can share it. So, if I... <laughs> Marissa, focus, focus. <laughs> Marissa, if I ask you a question, you say it's because I read a lot, okay? okay? You got it? Maybe you want to practice it once? No. Or you think you got it? Okay. No. Marissa! Yeah? How did you know what a monopoly is? I read a lot. Very good, Marissa. And Marissa, some of the time, I didn't have to ask. You get very confused, don't you? <laughs> and you lose your place in the book, Marissa? Marissa, when I go to a school or to a city and there's a young woman who's smart enough and brave enough to raise her hand and she knows what an anomaly is and she loses her place in books a lot, I tell her to tear a page off the newspaper stick it in there. <laughs> Marissa, Marissa, oh. come back, Marissa. Marissa, would I do that to you without shaking your hand? Have a seat. Marissa, come on. <laughs> Marissa, I'm proud you spoke up. Good job. Here is a bookmark for Marissa. Good job, Marissa. <laughs> uh, to Marissa and Christopher, before we go on any further, if you'd like to hang on to those as souvenirs, that's fine, that's wonderful. If you intend to spend those, um, I wouldn't go to a bank with them. I'd try a convenience store first. <laughs> anyway, the phone company was a monopoly. That means there was one phone company, and they had a real bad attitude. And if you were one minute late with your phone bill, bam, they shut you off just like that. My bill was so late and was so high, not only did they shut me off, I came home from work one day, and they had pulled all the wires off the house. So I had to wait, it's not funny. I had to wait to talk again. What do I do then? <laughs> Buy a cell phone? There were no cell phones back then. Cell phones back then were as big as a car. Write her a letter. That's exactly what I do. I write her letters. And I look at some of the young men in here. You're going to need a lot of help. And if you want to take notes, uh, I don't mind. I write things like, Dear Katie, baby. Don't laugh, it works. Dear Katie, baby, I love you so much. You're so beautiful. Okay, okay. And I send these letters off to Canada, and it's lucky for me that I did, because when we, this is? Michigan. This is Detroit, Michigan. Right across the river from Detroit is a city in Canada called Windsor. We moved to Windsor. And one day, Kay said to me those three special little words. I love you. Let's get married. That's, that's very nice. Uh, I'm glad you feel that way. And I, I don't want you to think I'm not flattered. I'm very flattered. But I don't think it's healthy that you're developing strong feelings like that for people that you, that you don't know. Maybe a counselor here. <laughs> she said those three little words that just make you oh, feel so good. She said, look, I love you, but I don't think you're doing everything you can. From the stories I've seen that you've written and the letters that I've seen that you've written, I think you could write a book. So why don't you take a year off work and see if you could write a book? So when I heard those three little words that make you feel so good inside, year off work. I took a year off work. And what I would do was go to the Windsor Public Library and I would sit in the children's section every day. And I would write. And I looked at it as a job. I said to myself, this is a job. I have to get this done. I, it's not a vacation. This is something I have to do as a job. I was working in a warehouse on loading trucks at the time. Didn't like my job, didn't like my boss, but I went every day and I gave her the respect she deserved. I was my own boss now, so I had to give myself the same respect. Every single day I would go and I would write for four hours. Uh, next morning, I get up at five o'clock every morning from working at factory for so long. Five o'clock, I do the hardest part of writing, the part that, of writing that everybody from a kindergartner 
to an eighth grader, to someone as old as I am, Paige, what's the hardest part of writing? Writing. Editing. Editing is the hardest part of writing, but it's the most important part because it's during the editorial process that you make it work better. So I did this for a full year, ended up with a manuscript that was 250 pages long. The Watsons go to Florida, it was called at the time. Um, when I got the family to Florida, the story just ended. Nothing happened. I knew there was more to the story. I waited until uh, one day my son brought home a poem called Ballad of Birmingham by Dudley Randall. It's about the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. When I heard that poem, I said to myself, the Watsons want to go to Birmingham. So I changed the story and sent the family to Birmingham. It's lucky for me that I did, because if I didn't, I can guarantee you, you would be in class today and I would be somewhere unloading trucks. <laughs> but the Watsons go to Birmingham, I finished that, ended up with a 250-page manuscript. Next step is to try to get it. Publish. But publishers don't want to hear from you unless you're a movie star or, an edit or a famous uh, athlete or unless you've written a book before. So I decided to enter two contests. One was a company in Boston, Massachusetts called Little Brown. The other was a company in New York City called Random House. I went back to work, came home one day, there was a letter on the table from Little Brown. I was a nervous wreck. If I won this contest, they publish my book and give me $7,000. So I tore this envelope open, my hands were shaking. I started to read, it said, Dear Christopher Curtis, thank you very much for sending us your manuscript for Watson's School to Birmingham, 1963. Thank you for entering our contest. And then it said, you have won. You have won. Said you lost. That hurt my feelings. But I had that other contest. Came home one day, there was a message on the answering machine. It was a woman with a really friendly, happy, cheery voice. I finally paid the phone bill. She said, hi, my name's Wendy Lamb. I'm an editor at Random House in New York City. We got your manuscript, The Watsons Go to Birmingham. Thank you for entering our contest. And then she said, you have won. You have won. She said, you lost. <laughs> then she said, but we like your story so much, we're going to publish it in. This caused so much celebrating in my house, you know what we did? We did something better than party. We went to Red Lobster for dinner. Yeah. Yeah. We blew the budget because I knew once you publish a book, you're not quite a millionaire, but you're filthy rich. I don't know any of you, when you were coming in, did you happen to see parked out front? There was a brand new 2007 Mercedes-Benz ML430 sports utility vehicle, black with a gray leather interior, 12 inch CD changing in the front of the back, 22 inch chrome rims. Anybody see that out there? It's not mine. Probably belongs to one of these librarians in here. I got a real surprise when I found this book was going to cost $17 hardcover in the store. That's a lot of money, $17. How much of that $17 should the person who sat down for a year and wrote and worked, how much of that $17 should I get? All of it sounds very reasonable. I hope you become a publisher when you grow up. Out of the $17, I get $1.70. And that hurt my feelings. But my editor explained why. She said, well, we pay for the ink, we pay for the paper, we pay for the front stick to the printing press, we pay to get it printed, we pay for the publicity, we pay for the cover. They've got a beautiful office in New York City that they have to pay for. And by the time that and all everything else is done, Christopher Curtis and most authors get about 10% or $1.70. That hurt my feelings. I think it's terrible. Do you? Yes! Yeah. Really? Yes! Yeah. Take down this address. 1540 Broadway, New York, New York, 10036. Write them a letter, tell them to pay authors more money. Another thing hurt my feelings about the book. I found out they paid the woman who designed the cover more than they paid me at first. 
And the reason for that is, you've all heard the saying, don't judge a book by its cover. But everybody does. And they found you walking to a bookstore, and you'll look at this cover for 3.2 seconds. And if you don't like the way the cover looks, you have this strong urge to rush out and buy another Harry Potter book. That hurt my feelings. Another thing about the cover hurt my feelings. My editor called and said, do you have any pictures of your family? Maybe we can put your family on the cover. I said, of course I do. So I sent a picture of my little sister, Sydney, and when the book came, Sydney's picture was right on the cover. I sent a picture of my mother and father, book came, mom and dad, right on the cover of the book. I sent a picture of me and my little brother, book came, I have no idea who these two little boys are on the cover of the book. <laughs> We were rejected. <laughs> now my son was 15 years old at the time and had a real smart mouth and he said, I don't know why you're acting surprised, you know why you were rejected. <laughs> I said, why? He told me, you're too ugly to go on the... <laughs> I, I, I don't know, I don't want to be rude or anything, but I was in Lexington, Kentucky last week. Maybe they raised kids a little better in Lexington than they do here, because when I told them that in Lexington, they didn't laugh. They all said together, oh no, Mr. Curtis, you're not ugly. Oh no, Mr. Curtis, you're not ugly. But they sounded sincere in Lexington. <laughs> But anyway, the book finally came out. Uh, this book, in many ways, belongs to my son, Stephen, because I was a first-time author. I didn't know who to give the book to, that he give me any good advice. Stephen was very good about that. He was a big help with this, so that book belongs to him. The next book that I wrote is <laughs> But Not Buddy. Let me say that. <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> Let me hear you say it with a Texas accent. <laughs> This book belongs to my daughter, Sydney. And the reason this belongs to Sydney is Sydney was five years old when I was writing it. And she came up to me one day and said, Daddy, I wrote a song, do you want to hear it? And inside I said, oh God, no. Because I'd heard her songs before and they were very repetitive. And Sydney didn't have the best voice in the world when she was five. But I tried to be encouraging dad, so I said, sure, Sydney, let me hear your song. So whenever Sydney's going to sing, she does the same thing. She stands very tall. She pretends she's holding a microphone. She clears her throat. <coughs> and she announces the name of the song. She said, this song is called Mommy Says No. <laughs> and the way Mommy Says No goes is, Mommy says no, Mommy says no, I listen, you don't, wah ha ha ha. <laughs> and she repeated it again and again. And after about the fifth time, I said, Sydney, that's a very nice song, but you can't keep saying the same thing over and over. Sweetheart, you gotta put another verse in there. She thought about two seconds, said, okay. <laughs> Mommy says no, part two. <laughs> Mommy says no. Mommy says no. I listen, you don't. Wah ha ha ha. The building falls down. The building falls down. You be crushed, I don't. Wah ha ha. <laughs> and when I heard that, I said, that's got to go in a book. So if you look on page 124 of, <laughs> you'll see Sydney's song. And we got a real surprise when the book came, because if you look on the copyright page, and that's the page that only those Mercedes Driving's librarians look at, it says published by Random House Incorporated, 1340 Broadway, New York, New York. Copyright 1999 by Christopher Paul Curtis. And under that it says, Lyrics from Mommy Says No. Copyright 1999 by Sidney Mackenzie Curtis. Used by permission of the author. <laughs> so Sidney said, does that mean I'm an author? I said, it sure does. Do you like Sidney's song? Yeah. Yeah. Would you like to sing it with me? to help lead the song. What is your name? 
Dominique, you ready to do this? Sit up very straight. Hold your microphone. Clear your throats. Here we go. Mommy says no. Mommy says no. I listen to you the wah-ha-ha-ha. Dominique, you're supposed to be leading it. It's not rah, 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 rah. It's wah-ha-ha-ha. You ready? You got it? Wah-ha-ha. Mommy says no. Mommy says no. I listen, you know why. The building falls down. The building falls down. You get crushed, I don't. Why? Give yourselves a hand. Give yourselves a hand. What? Dominique, when I go to a school and there's a student who's brave enough to sit here and lead the song like you did for all these students, you need a bookmark too, Dominique. There's a bookmark for Dominique. A lot of great things have happened to me because I follow a dream and wrote the Watsons go to Birmingham. You've got to follow your dreams. You never know where they'll take you. One of the cool things that happened was we got a call about seven or eight years ago to come to New York City because somebody wanted to make a movie out of the Watsons go to Birmingham. So Kay and Sydney and I went to New York. We went to this place called the William Morris Agency. We opened the door, we walked in, and we met Whoopi Goldberg. And she bought the rights to make a movie about the book. She never made it. And, but that wasn't the cool thing. The cool thing is Whoopi, and I call her Whoopi because we're, it's not funny. We're just like this now. Whoopi knew that Sydney was coming, so she brought a present for Sydney. And the present she brought for Sydney was a Whoopi doll. And it's the scariest doll you've ever seen. In life. It's about this tall, and I think Whoopi had some bad ones she was trying to get rid of. Because ours looks like it's got a sore neck and his head is hanging to the side like this. And it's got one hand up like this. And it's holding something that says Hai Chu on it. And what Hai Chu is, is a candy from Japan. And the people in Japan weren't eating it right. They were chewing it and spitting it out like gum. The company wanted them to chew it, swallow it. So their solution was to make this doll. So we're sitting at this table. There's Kay. There's Sydney. There's Whoopi. Here I am. Whoopi reaches down in the bag, puts the doll on the table. Sydney looks up at it and goes, <laughs> Whoopi claps her hands twice, and the doll starts to walk. And it walks like Frankenstein with a sore neck. But it also starts to talk, and it says over and over, chew, chew, swallow, chew, chew, swallow. When Sydney saw this, she was terrified. So to bring the doll home, we had to put it in a bag so she couldn't see it and take the batteries out so she it wouldn't talk anymore. But that shows you, follow your dreams. You never know where your dreams might take you. I never dreamed I'd be in Jamestown, New York, talking about a book that I'd written. I never dreamed I'd have a Whoopi Goldberg doll hiding under my bed in home. <laughs> but I do. Now, I think we have time for questions if there are I think we've got some pre-set questions. We do. Unless you, this young man, he's got an Ohio State sweatshirt on, which obviously means he has problems. Yeah. 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 Do you have a question? Take a look at this and take Michigan. You have a question? See what I said. Okay. <laughs> In your book, you uh, reference the uh, concept of Wolpoo. Could you explain that? The Wolpoo. I get more questions about the Wolpoo than anything else. In the story, Grandma Sands tells the boys, don't go down to the water because you'll get caught up in the whirlpool and you'll get drowned. Uh, Byron tells Kenny, Grandma Sands has a heavy southern accent. Byron tells Kenny, she said, you get caught up by the Wolpoo which is Winnie the Pooh's evil twin brother that nobody writes about. So 
Kenny is off in the water and he's starting to drown. One of the things that happens when you get oxygen cut off to your brain, some of the time you hallucinate, you start to see things. Kenny imagined that the Woolpoo had him. He was scared to death. He was trying to understand what was going on. So he thought the Woolpoo had him was bringing him down. The second time he saw the Woolpoo was where? In the church. In the church, Kenny had gone into the church and in between the smoke, when smoke would clear, he saw the wool poo again. And what I think happened, one of the things that your brain does, it protects you some of the time from something really horrible. If something really horrible were to happen right now, a lot of times it wouldn't register. You'd be looking at it, but you wouldn't see it. So uh, what I think is, Kenny must have seen the bodies of one of the girls that had been killed. And instead of seeing this maimed, destroyed little girl, Kenny's mind saw the wool poo, which just came to represent death. So the wool poo came to represent death to Kenny. Do you ever get writer's block? Do I? No, I don't. I don't believe in writer's block. I think that once you say to yourself, you got writer's block, you got writer's block. You got a problem. Uh, lots of times, if something doesn't go the way you want it to, it's because something in the story isn't right. Young people in particular, you have to be very patient with yourself. I have four rules for young people who want to write. Rule number one, write every day. Writing is like anything else that you do. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Rule number two, have fun when you're writing. When you write, you're a very, very powerful person. You can do anything you want. You can turn all of these adults in here, except for Mr. Curtis, into rats in a story if you want. And then set them in a room with a bunch of pit bulls and see what happens. You can do things like that as a writer. Have fun with your writing. Rule number three, be patient with yourself. Particularly as a young person, the story's not going to go where you want it to go a lot of times. Just be patient. Don't say you have writer's block. That's, don't believe in that. You, if you have a problem, move on to something else. Your mind will work on it when you're not even thinking about it. Rule number four of the rules every writer must follow, ignore all rules. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, once you develop a writing skill, once you learn how to write, it's going to take a long time, develop your own style, write in your own way. Just because someone says you can't do it like that doesn't mean you can't. Develop your own style. Those are my four rules for writing. You are the recipient of a Newbery Honors Award, a Newbery Award. What does that mean to you, Christopher Paul Curtis? It, winning awards, how many writers do we have in here? We should have, every, every hand here should have gone up. I, Sarah is definitely right. Writers, Sarah, you'll agree with me on this, I'm sure. One of the things about writing is you're insecure about your writing, right? When you write something, it's something, good writing is very personal. You're exposing yourself when you write. And it's hard to give that to somebody else to have them read it. And it's good to get recognition, like to win the essay contest. That's a very good thing. Because, or to win a Newbery Award, because it says you're doing a good job. And we need that recognition, we need that stroke, it's a good thing. So it, it means a lot to me personally uh, to be recognized by, uh, by librarians as a good writer, because who does more and better and deeper reading than librarians? Not many people. In the Watch Go to Birmingham, 1963, what parts of this story was true? Nothing about going south was. Uh, the one of the main parts that was true, you remember a chapter called Nazi Parachutes Attack America and get shot down over the Flint River by Captain Byron Watson and his flamethrower of Death. That was me. When I was about 10 years old, I wasn't as creative as Byron. I didn't like toilet paper parachutes, but I loved the sound of a freshly lit match getting toilet water. And I'd light them and throw them in the <laughs> I'm lighting and throwing them in, tss, tss. and the bathroom door came open, and my mother came in and said, what are you doing? And I said, nothing, mama. And she came up to me and said, light one more match in this house, and I'll burn you. And I thought, yeah, you're going to burn me. So I gave her a little time to cool off. About a week later, I got smart. I locked the bathroom door. I got down on my knees. I'm lighting and flip, tss. Boom! I love up and there my mother is. She broke the bathroom door down. She reached in. She grabbed me by the neck like this. She lifted me straight up in the air with one hand like that. 
And I can remember thinking, I never would have done it if I knew she was this strong. <laughs> she took me downstairs, threw me on the couch, and said, don't you move. And I said, yes, mama. And she went to the kitchen, and she came back, and I knew she was serious because she was carrying a book of matches, a band-aid, and a jar of Vaseline. And she said, stick your finger out. And I said, yes, mama. And I stuck my finger out, and my head was shaking, and I closed my eyes. And I can hear the match go, and I can smell that strong sulfur smell. And my mother said, if you, and I could feel my finger getting warmer, and my finger started getting hot, light another match in this house. Now, who hasn't read the Watson's Go to Birmingham? Okay, I'm not going to tell you what happened. Read the book. But I was surprised they let me keep that in there, because that sounds vaguely like, Child abuse, torture, you take your pick. But we have to remember this was the 1960s. Parents were different in the 1960s. My mother had a problem. I might have burned the house down. I probably should have had some serious psychiatric counseling. You and I would have been in there together. <laughs> we couldn't afford that. And this was also before we had Oprah to tell us, don't do that to your kids. By the way, all these questions are from the students. They've all submitted these in advance, so to all of you, thank you. Really appreciate it. What's your next book? My next book is called, which will be out in October, is called Elijah of Buxton. This is? Michigan. This is Detroit. Buxton is a city about 40 miles in Canada, inside of Canada, that back in the 1800s was a terminus, the ending of the Underground Railroad. And at that time, there was a settlement there that had over 2,000 former slaves. It was like a utopia. It was economically self-sustaining. They had their own sawmill. They sold trees, lumber. They had a tram that ran six miles from Buxton down to Lake Erie that carried the logs down. Uh, there was no crime in Buxton. The schools were excellent. The kids were learning Greek, Latin, calculus. The schools were so good that many of the white schools had to close because they started sending their students to the kids in Buxton. So I've done a story about, uh, narrated by a 10-year-old boy named Elijah. And Elijah is famous for two things. The first thing is, Elijah was the first child born free in Buxton. Um, Buxton was a very famous place in the United States. Frederick Douglass came and visited several times. John Brown visited several times. In the story, uh, the second thing that Elijah is known for Frederick Douglass came to visit and when Elijah was a baby and he held Elijah up over his head like this and he said to the uh, people there, this is our future. This is what we're living for, this child born free. And he's holding Elijah up in the air and he's shaking Elijah like this and Elijah throws up on Frederick Douglass. <laughs> so that's the second thing that Elijah's known for. This is my favorite book. Up to this time, the Watsons go to Birmingham has been my favorite. This book I like better than the Watson. I just absolutely fell in love with the character. It came very easily. I wrote it in about six months, which is extremely quick for me. So uh, that will be out in October. Look forward to that. Why did you uh, uh, end your story when the focus at the end with the Birmingham bombing? Um, the story ends, the, first of all, the story is not a civil rights story. It's a family story. It's about an African-American family. And I want you to feel like you're a part of that family. One of the greatest things that people come up to me, this young people come up to me and say is, it's like you're writing about my family. It's like you're in the, uh, the closet listening to things that go on in my family. I want people to realize a family is a family. And I want, when the bomb goes off in Birmingham, I want you to feel like, how would it feel to not know if my sister my daughter, my grandchild, was in that church when that bomb went off. So the story, the family goes to Birmingham, they come back, uh, it ends with Kenny going behind the world famous Watson Pet Animal Hospital, uh, trying to heal himself, and Byron pulling him out. Byron is growing up. One of the things we see is Byron is growing up, Byron is maturing, he's realizing what is important. And I, I think I ended it because I think I got Kenny through his little crisis, and we see Byron grow into it. One of the hardest things about being a writer is knowing when to end the story. 
And one of the advice, bits of advice that they give you is cut the last two chapters, and then that'll be the end. Because a lot of times you have a tendency to over-explain and to just drag the story on for too long. A lot of times young people say to me, why'd you leave us hanging? You know, like in the Watsons or in Bud Not Buddy, because they're not pat endings to it. Because I don't think life is like that. You never know what's going to happen. And reading is great because you put so much into it. So much of you goes into a story as you're reading it, which is what makes it different from a movie. In a movie, you're seeing someone else's idea of the story. In a book, you're putting your own idea in there. And that means that my idea of what happened next and your idea might be totally different, but there is no right or wrong. Your idea is just as good as mine. You mentioned in your presentation that the inspiration for changing it to Birmingham from Florida was really based on a Dudley Randall uh, ballad and to the I could spend a second perhaps to share with the audience the ballad of Birmingham by Dudley Randall, which was your inspiration for changing the location. This was 1969. Mother dear, may I go downtown instead of out to play and march the streets of Birmingham in a freedom march today. No, baby, no, you may not go, for the dogs are fierce and wild, and clubs and hoses, guns and jails aren't good for a little child. But mother, I won't be alone, other children will go with me and march the streets of Birmingham to make our country free. No, baby, no, you may not go, for I fear those guns will fire, but you may go to church instead and sing in the children's choir. She has combed and brushed her night dark hair and bathed rose petals sweet and drawn white gloves on her small brown hands and white shoes on her feet. The mother smiled to know that her child was in the sacred place, but that smile was the last smile to come upon her face. For when she heard the explosion, her eyes grew wet and wild. She raced through the streets of Birmingham, calling for her child. She clawed through the bits of glass and brick, then lifted out a shoe. Oh, here's the shoe my baby wore. But baby, where are you? You dedicate your book in memory of A.D. May Collins, Carol Robertson, and Cynthia Wesley, and Denise McNair. Why? Those were the four girls who were killed during the bombing. Uh, I put it the, the toll for one city for one day because this is what these girls gave their lives for something. And they made a change. Uh, they, they didn't want to do it, but a lot of times people lose their lives for no reason and nothing comes from it. This, these four little girls made a real difference because when America saw what had happened to these four little girls, that they were killed because they simply wanted an education, that they wanted to go to school, uh, that somebody hated them so much that they killed them, it made a difference in the country and it brought about real change. So I think these little girls were very important historic figures and uh, I, I wanted to dedicate my book to them. I say thank you so much to all of you for coming and participating in this and especially thank you to the Robert H. Jackson Center for what you're doing here. This is so important. Your minds are very important and a lot of people are trying to work to win your minds. Have tolerance for people who are different than you. Uh, don't be afraid of people just because they're different. This kind of thing goes a long way to making that happen. And thank you for once again for inviting me. Thank you very much.